Thank you for joining me for this episode. Today, we're joined by Randy Kojima, who's going to be speaking about topographical indices that enhance myopia management success. Randy is a clinical researcher and the development director for Precision Technologies, which is based in Vancouver, Canada. He serves as a research scientist and clinical instructor at the Pacific University College of Optometry. Additionally, he's a clinical advisor to Medmont Instruments in Melbourne, Australia. Randy's published numerous articles and submitted posters on various different contact lens related topics. He's also been a contributing author for a number of textbook chapters. He lectures globally and enjoys sharing insights, methods, and research with eye care colleagues from around the world. Randy is a fellow of both the American Academy of Optometry and the British Contact Lens Association. He's also a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society and the International Academy of Orthokeratology. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We're joined today with Randy Kojima. And as many of you know, or you've heard from a previous myopia podcast, uh, Randy is really somebody I look up to with regards to a stigma, to, uh, with regards to topography and evaluating orthokeratology and understanding how it works with our patients. Randy, thanks a, a lot for being here. I wanted to ask you if you could talk to us a little bit about um, what we're looking for, for an ideal myopia management orthokeratology fit for our patients. When you and I first started this process, you know, we were looking for the big blue, right? We were looking for this big centration and we were looking to make sure that everybody had perfect vision uh, day in and day out all day long. Um, and more recently, uh, you've kind of told me that maybe that's not exactly what we should be shooting for. So kind of talk to us about some ideal orthokeratology for myopia management. Oh man, you just nailed it. That that thought about how we used to approach ortho K is utterly 180 degrees different than what it is today. I mean, like you said, we we did want the big blue treatment zone. We wanted to reduce aberrations for patients. We didn't want decentration. But in myopia control, we actually want all of those aberrations. We want a small treatment zone. So when you look at the axial map, you want to see a tiny area of blue in the center um, and then have it gradiate out. That tells you that you're pushing the foveal effect you need. But when you look at the blue treatment area and you see these gradations of uh, change in power, that's what's going to push the plus that's going to slow down the eye. So that's one factor that the small treatment zone makes for higher spherical aberration. And the research is pretty clear. The higher the spherical aberration, the less the axial growth. So that's one piece. Then the other is, boy, we always try to provide good centration, don't we, Dave, that um, we're, we're trying to have that treatment be as wickedly centered as we can because we know in adults, especially if their LASIK procedure is somehow decentered, they're going to have more aberrations. Um, but mm -hmm. kids just aren't that sensitive to both the treatment zone size and the treatment zone position. And the research, uh, especially more recently, has shown us that another aberration, another one that we probably don't understand that well, the HOAs, at least I, I should admit that I don't understand them as well as I should, but uh, coma as an example is one of those pieces that also contributes to myopia control. So if you ramp up the coma, you decrease the axial growth. And how, how do, do you do increase that? the coma? How do, we, yeah. how do we increase the coma? Yeah, de decentration. It, yeah. So it, it actually turns out that small treatment zone and maybe a little bit of decentration is not actually a bad thing for creating good matter. myopia control. 
if it's up, down, left, right, or is it just going to be the one that I end up with all the time anyway? Whatever which one that is. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if the research is clear enough on that one. That's a great question, though. Do, does it matter which direction it goes? It, it seems that the researchers, the myopia researchers are telling us, send the blur into the eye, send the aberrations into the eye. But where specifically do we need to and what magnitude? You know, these are all answers we have yet to suss out. Mm hmm. So all along, being a crappy orthokeratologist has really <laughs> been something that's been made me a successful myopia man manager, huh? <laughs> is, that, is that what you're saying? No. It's, uh, it's crazy to think that, that it, it, you know, you said it right in the beginning, that everything is kind of opposite with where we started in orthok and where we are now in myopia yeah. control orthok. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it kind of makes us think back to uh, all the patients who we had as slam dunks and they were great. Um, and then the patients that, you know, many of us and some people got frustrated with orthokeratology and quit doing it because they had a little decentration or the patient reported some uh, frustration with their vision um, with maybe a little glare or halo. And we thought, well, that's not going to work. You know, these people aren't uh, getting the outcomes that we want. And it wouldn't be the outcome we would want in an adult. But with our children, you know, I, I think of how many times I brought people back and back and back and back again to try to improve on the, that decentration. But, um, you know, at, at what point are you, if you were seeing a patient in my exam chair, are you going to bring the patient back and, and refit them? So I, I do an overnight, I see the patient back at day one, two, or three, and the patient's lenses are decentered, and I have 20, 25 vision. Are you going to bring the patient back? Like how much decentration would you uh, consider okay? Yeah, I think what we should be doing is looking at the baseline topography and determining, does this eye have natural, let's say, inferior displacement? And my treatment is now inferior, as you would expect, because the lens has to follow the natural, the natural shape of the eye. So at that point, maybe this is as good as it gets. And your, your question is, is uh, important, that what is too much decentration? And I think if you see a displaced apex before you even start this process and your lens has decentration, but your quality of vision is there, I'm not sure we need to modify it. If the patient has good quality AM to PM vision, uh, if they may even have a shot at a reduced wear schedule, uh, you know, all of these things might suggest that we don't need to make changes. And you know, happy, a happy cornea, the physiologic response is good. The comfort is good. So all of the signs are saying that this is working for the patient. And if decentration is actually good for myopia control, then, hey, should we be fixing it? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if it ain't broke, maybe we shouldn't be fixing it. But yeah. Dave, it, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way. If if you've got a case where hey, it's not looking that great, decentration is is certainly there. Uh, quality of vision isn't 100% in the AM. It's even worse in the PM. Boy, that that's something we got to fix, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, a, a little key for us, you know, a clinical pearl with regards to this is usually I can tell if there's decentration before I even look at my topographer, if my autorefractor is picking up weird cylinder, you know, and, you know, the axis is, is varied if there's multiple measurements on it, or you're doing some retinoscopy and you're seeing some weird, uh, weird findings. Um, realize that if your autorefractor is telling you something that doesn't match up with what the visual acuity is telling you, that's okay. That's orthokeratology for us, right? Um, oftentimes I see a little bit of that decentration in the center or close to the center and the autorefractor is picking that up, particularly if there's a big pupil. And that's that. what, what we're kind of saying here is that may be okay if the patient is getting the ideal vision. Um, certainly we're not promoting dangerous 
orthokeratology that's decentered <laughs> and causing all sorts of problems. Uh, I don't think I don't think you're promoting that, Randy, and I'm not. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, Randy, I thought one of the other things uh, we could touch on real quick here is comfort with orthokeratology. So. Um, every once in a while, I have a patient who reports that they're not comfortable wearing their lenses and the parent comes back, you know, week two, week three, and they say, you know, we, we just can't convince the kid to put the lenses on. What are some strategies that we might be looking for in the fit that would indicate, hey, change this, it might help the patient to be more comfortable? Yeah, I, I might approach this from an outside in perspective, uh, in that ortho K lenses always look like they're touching in the center. So it's kind of hard to use the apex, the apical clearance as a, a method to say, is it steep or is it flat? So let's start from the periphery. And in any rigid contact lens, edge lift has to be within a certain range, doesn't it? If the edge is too wide, if the edge is too high, then of course the patient's gonna be sensitive. If it's too tight, if it's too low to the surface, impinging, then we're gonna to have to modify it. So the edge might be one place I'd start, and then moving in from the edge, what does the alignment zone look like? Do you see alignment on opposing sides, but we've got that dumbbell shape pattern. We've got extra fluid at, you know, the opposing meridian. Is our tericity off? Do we have inadequate tericity for the eye surface? Do we have excessive tericity for the eye surface? So that landing is so important. And then the final one that comes to my mind immediately, Dave, is, is uh, size of lens. You know, if we, if we see a nice edge, a, a good half millimeter width of edge lift, kind of that textbook ideal amount, and we see that alignment zone just inside of it appearing to touch down 360 degrees, then what are we going to modify? What do we look at next when we've got a good edge and a good landing? Well, if you're seeing the lens moving around a bit too much, then does that suggest that we don't have enough sagittal depth, like a large enough lens for the eyes? So that might be the next thing I'd look at is, does the lens appear to float around a bit, even though it has a good edge lift and a good landing? Maybe a slightly bigger is the way to go. And most manufacturers or contact lens experts would say VID less 0.8. So if you have an 11.8 VID, we should probably be in around an 11 millimeter lens. Experts like Mountford would say, well, if you're already in VID minus 0.8 and it's still a little bit sloppy and the patient's getting discomfort from it, or decentered treatment zones, then you can fit to within 0.5 millimeters of VID. So on that 11.8 millimeter eye, maybe we could fit up to an 11.3 diameter lens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, it's it, sometimes it's pretty, uh, pretty profound how just changing that diameter for some of our patients can really make uh, a big, a big change for them. Randy, uh, last thing before I let you go is uh, there was a study that we just recently had published here that, that you were a part of, and that was the, the Volt study. Um, it was a, a, a great study, by the way. Can, can you share a little bit about what the study was and some of the findings and how we might be able to apply that in clinic? Yeah, I think one of the things that's helpful to understand is when ortho-K was created, reverse geometry ortho-K, it was mostly for occupational purposes, you know, to help those mm -hmm. firefighters and uh, police officers and pilots get through that first step of their process, the occupational vision exam. And it was really yeah. a very temporary procedure, wasn't it, Dave? And, and yeah. it's kind of evolved in that in the late 90s, it became a alternative, a non-surgical alternative to a refractive surgery, right? But then in the millennium, then we started to question whether this ortho K lens might actually be contribute to slowing down eye growth. And it wasn't until 2007 that we figured out that, hey, ortho K lenses are actually helping to slow down eye growth by about 50%. So 50% right. less eye growth on average. But the question is, is that as good as it gets? We're applying a lens designed for adults 
and applying it for kids in myopia control, is there a way we can do it better? So the VOLT study was meant to test if we manipulate the optic zone size and manipulate the fluid layer, the shape of the fluid layer underneath, can we create stronger forces? And as we talked about earlier, aberrations is a big deal in myopia control. If we can increase the aberrations, we can decrease the eye growth. So that mm -hmm. Volt study was meant to uh, test whether we could increase those aberrations and slow down that growth. And the way it's worked out is uh, the if you compare the smaller optic zone, the myopia controlling construction, to the control groups, it's about an 89% uh, improvement, or it's 89% less eye growth using that smaller optic zone. So Dave, I, I'm pretty excited. I think we're, we're on a path now as an industry to maybe look at how we can do better orthokeratology for myopia control. We don't have all the answers yet, but certainly optic zone and tear layer profile appears to be one way that we can up that spherical aberration, up the plus power that enters the eye to send that signal to slow down eye growth. I, I just think it's uh, it's brilliant and it, it, makes, uh, it makes sense when we step back and think about it, particularly with soft multifocals being successful, having that plus in the periphery with the correction of the minus in the center, um, I, I don't know why I didn't think about it sooner with my orthokeratology. And um, it's been something that has been hypothesized for the last couple of years. Um, so Randy, does this mean that somebody who has a, a, a diopter uh, or a diopter and a half of, um, of correction is not an ideal candidate for ortho K. They may be benefiting somewhere else. Uh, is can we do ortho K on low myopes to slow down the progression? Do do we know? And do you have a perspective on that? Boy, this is what a great question, Dave. This literally just came up today with our mentor Pat Caroline. And uh, when you have a minus one myope and their eye has grown as it, um, elongated by a little bit, um, does that eye, does the back of that eye have such a curve that we need to really push a high amount of plus power into the eye versus let's say a minus six myope that really has a very elongated eye and would have a very curved retina. So what does the low myope require as amount of plus to slow down that eye growth. And boy, I don't think we know when we pull and, and talk to experts in the field, they'll say, yeah, I fit lots of minus ones and they've absolutely stopped their progression, but I fit some minus ones and, and they've still grown. So I don't know if we know the answers. We, we have to have a way to test which shapes of, let's say, retinal shapes or which amounts of blur that the patient can accept will um, give us a signal that we need to manipulate the, the construction of these lenses. Right now, we all we can do, Dave, is, I think, is just push the maximum plus, the maximum spherical aberration that we can. So I don't think people should be afraid to fit a low myope knowing that they're not going to create a ton of spherical aberration, but we can certainly monitor those patients closely. And we know the progression rates should be in a Caucasian eye, a half diopter per year for a, a progressing myope. And if we're keeping that progression under that rate, then we got to assume that we're doing okay, right? And in an Asian eye, three quarters of a diopter per year. And if, if we're not um, able to keep the eye from progressing by, you know, those degrees, then we know we got to change what we're doing, either add ortho K and atropine, which has been found to work very effectively. Mm -hmm. Combination combo. treatment is mm -hmm. really working well, or maybe this new construction, our, our understanding of manipulating optic zone and hydraulic force, maybe that's where we need to move. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, a lot to think about, some very exciting information. Um, thank you for being part of that study and you know, kind of taking that on so we can start answering the questions about uh, optic zone and so forth. And 
I sure appreciate you being here, Randy, and for uh, your commitment to this space. I know you travel all over the uh, country and all over the world when it's not COVID season, um, and we're excited to get you back out there and do that again. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Myopia podcast, and uh, please make sure to leave a five-star review and uh, subscribe so you can hear more great content on the topic of myopia. We would like to thank Euclid for providing their educational support to make this podcast possible. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.